to know that like so much of our understanding for like like kind of like manufacturing consent for putting an AI into a person that that process began in the body of a dark-skinned Haitian woman mm -hmm. was like very insane to me. Hey y'all, welcome to Bitch Talk. I'm your host, Erin. And I'm co-host Ange, aka Captain Party. And for more than 10 years, this show has celebrated underrepresented voices in pop culture and beyond. But not in a snore kind of way. And that's why our listeners and followers voted as 48 Hills Best of the Bay Best Podcast in 2022 and 2023. Correct. And we're pushing for that 2024, y'all. <laughs> If you like what you hear, follow us on Instagram and check out our website, bitchtalkpodcast.com. And please rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Honestly, we know you love judging people. We're asking you, <laughs> judge us. Judge us. Help us. And now, on with the show. Click. Hey, Bitch Talkers. This is Erin. We're flashing back to Sundance 2024 and talking about the movie Seeking Mavis Beacon. We have director and lead investigator Jasmine Jones, as well as associate producer slash co-investigator Olivia Michaela Ross. We will be joined by our festival bitch, John Wildman. And we're flashing back today because this is a very uh, hyper local movie to the Bay Area and also because it's out in San Francisco today, September 6th. So enjoy. All right, we are back on Bitch Talk and FilmsGoneWild.com. My name is John Wildman, the editor-in-chief of Films Gone Wild. With me is Angela Tabora and Aaron Lim from Bitch Talk. And on this segment, we're going to talk about the documentary Seeking Mavis Beacon. And we'll have our filmmakers introduce themselves for the audio so you recognize their voices. So, Jasmine. Hi, this is Jasmine Jones, director and lead investigator of Seeking Mavis Beacon. And this is Olivia Michaela Ross, associate producer, co-investigator of Seeking Mavis Beacon. Awesome. And we always have our filmmakers introduce the audience to the film because they haven't seen it as yet. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the film. Man. Okay, so Seeking Mavis Beacon, I imagine there's some people in the audience who maybe are familiar with Mavis Beacon from their own educational experiences, but essentially, uh, Mavis Beacon was a fictional typing teacher who was put on the cover of the software in the late 80s, and the software went on to sell up to 15 million copies worldwide, and there's a whole Mandela effect about the actual character where people thought Mavis Beacon is a real person, but in fact it is a Haitian woman named Renee L'Esperance who modeled for the software and has never been interviewed on the record, was paid $500, and disappeared from the public eye. So Olivia and I are these little, you know, e-girl investigators who are thinking about ethics and identity and surveillance as we try to track down this unsung cultural icon. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jasmine, I wanted to know why was it so important for you to bring Olivia onto the project? And then what did she bring to um, the project, what, what you thought was missing? Yeah, I was two years into development with this project um, and was thinking about it a lot. And I knew that I wanted it to be a personal documentary where I was on screen. But it was when I actually encountered Olivia and the theoretical work she was doing around cyber doulas and data trauma where I was like, wait, this person is giving language to the experience that I am trying to describe. Uh, and she's also just incredibly fun to hang out with. So there's a DM. There's a DM that was sent to Olivia like, hey, maybe if you would just maybe, I don't know if you have capacity, but like doing this thing. And Olivia responded very favorably. Um, it was 2020. I just finished like my first semester of Zoom college and I was like, mm. you could not get me to pay another cent for this. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I had met I had met Jazz at like an art and technology festival and through like their collective organizing work um, and was just like really inspired and had just left like a really intense like competitive high school environment um, and felt just very empowered about like yeah just the kind of work that could be done through documentaries and like what it means to like just like be curious in a compassionate like like the care centered way um and yeah when I was a I was a student at like this artist run school in the West Village the school for put at computation and Jazz came in and spoke um about Mavis Beacon and kind of like really that was my first like encounter with 
Mavis Beacon teaches typing as a topic because I was born in 2001. (laughs) (laughs) I don't actually actually have clear memories of learning how to type. Like my brain thinks I always knew, but there's like no way that's true. Um, I remember having a library class in school where we like learn stuff about like how to cite sources and like what to use Wikipedia for and all of that different stuff. And I knew that like part of the learning objective for that course was that we wanted to raise our typing speed, but the softwares that we used to do that were like not nearly as interesting as Mavis Beacon teaching typing, teaches typing was. Um, and I just remember being like very, very thrilled to, yeah, from the standpoint where I was, where I was like thinking really deeply about just like black feminist philosophies of the internet, finding out that, you know, this kind of like history of like cyborg ontology and like these like examples of like yeah servile fembots that are so prevalent in our culture from like Mm. Siri, Alexa, and Cortana that have roots in some very like patriarchal Mm -hmm. often like quite orientalist like ideas about like what computers are for and like what like bodies are meant to do to know that like so much of our understanding for like like kind of like manufacturing consent for pers like putting an AI into a person that that process began in the body of a dark skinned Haitian woman mm-hmm. was like very insane to me, but also kind of very enlightening to me because it's like, ah, like there are like, there are people who have like trained me <laughs> for this day of like figuring out what the hell do we do about this? And what do we, what are the like philosophies? Who are the people that were in our community who could like, talk with us on camera and like help us kind of decode all of the different like concepts and ideas that were going on and so that was both like very complicating and also a relief in many ways yeah well if our audience can't tell already it's very entertaining and invigorating to hear the both of you speak yes and i loved watching your detective process and the creative mm-hmm. ways in which you shared it with the audience um but i was wondering if when you decided to embark on this journey you, you understood how emotional it was going to be for the both of you because quite a few times there are hardships and you kind of break down throughout the process you know um I was taught as a filmmaker to like lean into the discomfort and that's often where the juicy things lie. Um, So for me, oftentimes when I'm struggling through something personal, it is like intuitive to like pull out the camera. I think that's what helps me process difficult emotions, um, which is a blessing and a curse. And also when you're dealing with other people and their complicated emotions is not always the way of doing things. I think circling back to your last question, a benefit of working with Olivia that I didn't know at the time would be so pivotal is like so much of this film is about insider conversations that we're having. And as you know, the director and future editor, and also someone who's in front of the camera, oftentimes when we would like press record, I would just be like, I actually, I, there's so much in my head, like how am I just talking about Mavis, like what am I gonna say? I can, there's years of research. (laughs) And then also, especially for I'd say like the first six months at least of filming the project, when I am filming, it's like, I'm hamming it up. I'm speaking in sound bites for my future editor self. I'm setting Olivia up and being like, so what are we doing right now? <laughs> you, know, that, you know, it's just like, and it just felt so forced. And so I'm really grateful of having a friend to be in dialogue with and for us to just kind of get into our own world and for me to forget that like, we are making a movie right now and actually be like, wait, I'm hanging out with my friend and we're trying to get to the bottom of this thing. And so I think without Olivia, this whole search would have been a lot more performative. Whereas like, it's part of the reason it feels like, you know, it's a coming of age film and a road movie is because you're in the room with us as we're actually figuring things out in real time. Well, you know, and to your credit, we get to see it all. And, you know, or or we see a lot Mm -hmm. because, you know, I don't know what was edited out. (laughs) Um, But, you know, but that, but the, 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 the warts and all approach as we speak, say sometimes, um, really does enhance this. However, I, I'd really love for you to talk about the editing process because it's one thing to let the cameras roll while shit's going down and, and, and things are mm-hmm. happening. It's another thing to see it played back and, and, and some things you forgot to go, oh my God, did I say that? You know, did, did that happen? And are we going to keep that? Do we, should we keep it? Is it okay? You know, and, and, and because we, we still all have egos. Mm-hmm. Um, so talk about the editing process and winnowing, not just winnowing it down, all the footage mm-hmm. that you had, but also to kind of, both of you, to take yourselves out of it as participants and subjects 
Yeah, I mean, we started the editing process with our editor, John Fine. Um, while we still had like a year left of the investigation, we knew we were always preparing for kind of two endings. Mm. One where you find the person you're looking for and one where you don't. Mm -hmm. um, and so John put together an assembly cut that was essentially chronologically everywhere we had gone. And Olivia and I watched it and I, I had that reaction where I was like, this is insufferable. We are obnoxious. <laughs> uh, I hate us. <laughs> Too much talking. And I think that was a byproduct of working with people who like us and think we're delightful where I'm like, no, no, this is like too self-involved. It's, it's like too... it's getting navel gazy now like this. <laughs> Pull it back. Yeah, and just like things where it's like yeah I think yeah it's like I I know you like us John and you think this is cute but like this sucks so then we took that and worked with John and our also the cinematographer Yulen came into the edit as well who's also my partner and we also Olivia and I had spent a lot of time studying like the heroine's journey I think it's a great tool in terms of like the idea of it being like this circular thing and at least in the first quarter of the heroine's journey it's like they're borrowing the masculine techniques they're mimicking things which is what we were doing we were like looking at like detectives and you know true crime and noir and all of these things that we have very contentious relationships with and saying like what uh, methodologies can we try on and eventually when we also were like oh let's integrate our own intuition and like things we know to be true from the existing feminist theory that we are pulling from um then we found our form and yeah so i think in terms of structure um the film plays with time. What I will say, something that's interesting is the interviews, like the order of the interviews and the information, that is still chronological. So all the developers, all the people we talk to who are involved in the game, um, that does appear true to as we experienced it. But in terms of like our own lives and what happens in between, like you can just look at Olivia's face and tell I we're playing with I was all my baby fat, yeah. like on my face in the course of the project. Oh. That, was really, that was really quite insane. Don't look too close. Cause like, <laughs> yeah, like she's growing up before our eyes. And if you do study that, you'll be like, wait a second, uh, when did this happen? But oh. I do think in that way, it's like the film still feels very true to the experience that we had and the overall journey, but like, you know, it's not it's not a piece of journalism or you know, like yeah. the facts are the facts are also rooted in feeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it makes me very happy that you didn't lie to us. Um, <laughs> but you know, and and, and again, it, it's just such a a, a, a wonderful CSI junior detective ride <laughs> that we're taking in, even apart from the actual discovery process. Of of, uh, of 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 Mavis Bacon Be Beacon. Yeah, Mavis uh, Bacon is called, we yeah. slip up a lot. Too. I, 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 <laughs> my dad did refer to her throughout my whole childhood as Mavis Bacon. Mavis Bacon. Oh, <laughs> Bacon. <laughs> now now I feel just slightly better. No, just slightly it's, better. It, it's in conversation. <laughs> Again, the film is actually seeking Mavis Beacon. Screening at Sundance. We've been talking with director, writer, and cast member Jasmine Renee Jones and cast member Olivia Michaela Ross. It's been great talking to you guys. Thank you guys Thank so you. much. Thank you. We hope you uncover mysteries in the future. Yes. Uh, our future we, we mysteries. Have a few, yeah. And what I would love to just shout out is the hotline that is both on our Instagram and in the film is deliberately unblurred because it's open. It's open still. You can still call. We'd love to have your Mavis Beacon memories. Good, bad, and indifferent. Okay? So feel free to call the hotline. Haven't memorized it in the five years we've made this project, so look it up. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Love. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on today's show. You can find more information about this episode in our show notes. If you're missing us, you can visit us at bitchtalkpodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter and buy us a cup of coffee. Did you know we're also on the radio? You can find us at bff.fm. And lastly, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. All the cool bitches are doing it. This podcast is a proud member of the BFF.FM podcast network. Learn more at podcasts.bff.fm. BFF.FM, best frequencies forever.